From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello there and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The recent emergence of the Omicron variant has led to a rise in COVID infections worldwide. Statistics from Our World in Data show that nearly 60% of the world population has received at least one dose of a vaccine. But there is a huge gap. More than 90% of people in low-income countries are still waiting for the jab. The President of the United Nations General Assembly, Abdullah Shahid, will convene a high-level meeting at the UN General Assembly. The goal is to secure equitable access and make sure that vaccines are provided, I quote, to everyone, everywhere, at the earliest. President Shahid was on the hub on CGTN earlier, and he told me what the United Nations General Assembly can do to promote universal vaccination. Let's listen to what he had to say. I came to the presidency of the General Assembly uh, promising a presidency of hope. Uh, my presidency was based on five rays of hope. And the first ray of hope, or the first priority I was uh, concentrating on, is on recovering from COVID-19. And I believe that uh, on the recovery phase of COVID-19, uh, vaccine is the alternative. Uh, we have been able to find a vaccine uh, within a, such a short period of time. It's even good to call it a miracle vaccine. But you're right. Uh, certain parts of the world, we are seeing only 2-3% to 3 of the population being vaccinated, especially in the LDCs, in Africa, in many other parts of the world. But in some uh, countries, they are already starting to have the booster jab. If one thing this pandemic has taught us, it is that no one is safe until everyone is safe. So it is unacceptable that we are unable to provide vaccines to those countries who have not been able to get it yet. But I believe that uh, we have the capacity. I, I believe we have the means. What is lacking is the political will. At the United Nations, I'm going to use my convening power uh, to get the membership together. I'm convening a high-level uh, high meeting uh, to address the vaccine gap. I'm inviting all countries to come together. I'm also inviting vaccine producers to come attend this event. For once, we should not be finger pointing at each other. We should be trying to find a solution for this. We should be giving hope for the people of the world who require this vaccine. And I'm very hopeful that we will be able to achieve vaccine to all by end of 2022. No one is safe until and unless everyone's safe. Uh, I guess many experts would agree with you over there. Uh, President Shahid, um, the WHO has set a global target of 70% of the total population of the world to be vaccinated by mid-2022. Um, but to reach that goal, like you said, there needs to be more equitable vaccination, uh, global uh, you know, worldwide, globally. Uh, what do you plan to do currently, uh, given the fact that only a little over half of the world's population are vaccinated currently? Are you still hopeful that we can reach that target? I'm very hopeful. Uh, I have every trust in the goodness of humanity. And that is why I call my presidency a presidency of hope. I believe uh, that we collectively the United Nations is all about we the peoples. And it is uh, the only forum where the 193 countries come together and collectively we would be able to uh, find a way out of this uh, pandemic. That is possible, that is workable, and it is achievable. Why can't developing countries get their fair share of vaccines? One possible explanation is that powerful gatekeepers, such as major pharmaceutical companies, continue to withhold the money and keep technology for vaccine development away from the developing countries. 
in May of 2021. I spoke with Dr. Mago Kamoyani. She's an advisor to the People's Vaccine Alliance. She advocated uh, more vaccine for the most vulnerable in our societies. Today, I've invited her back to the hub on CGTN and asked her why global immunity has failed. Uh, Dr. Yanni, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, apparently, we're facing a very uh, a fluid and dynamic uh, and a worrying situation uh, that is uh, Omicron, uh, you know, that is wreaking havoc around the world. Um, what do we know about this virus so far? Uh, is it uh, more, you know, uh, contagious but less lethal? Well, it seems, I mean, we don't know everything about the virus or about this variant, Omicron or the others. But what is, uh, what is published so far, um, that it's, it's very, very contagious. Yes, it tr tr transmits between people very quickly. But so therefore it spreads very fast, but it, it seems to be mild. But if it spreads fast um, and, you know, so you have thousands or millions of people um, uh, infected, then you're bound to have more people that need hospitals and more deaths. So although it is mild so far, it still, um, it doesn't mean, oh, well, we treat it like a cold and just um, ignore it. That's not the, that shouldn't happen. And we also don't know what is coming around the corner. You know, we had Delta and then we thought, oh, well, you know, things are fine. People are vaccinated in, in, in rich countries and in some developing countries like China. Um, so we're okay, but then we have Omicron. So we're not okay. And what, what's next? We don't know. So how does that impact your work? Because you have been working so hard uh, to advocate uh, vaccine equality around the world. But uh, the fact is people who get two shots, uh, you know, still get uh, infected by Omicron. So what can vaccination really do to help them, you know, to help them, you know, uh, prevent them from getting uh, this new variant? Well, clearly um, Omicron is um, invading the, the, the the vaccines, so it decreases the efficacy of many vaccines, um, some to a degree that they're um, very, very less effective, and some just a little bit. So um, in the in the North, in, in rich countries, and in many developing countries, we started this booster vaccines. So that is fine, you have three doses, uh, but on the other hand, You've got the rest of the world that is not vaccinated with one dose or, do or two doses anyway. So you've got still a huge reservoir available for the virus to mutate and produce yet another variant. So but do we know if people who get three shots would be safer from Omicron versus those who only took one shot or two shots? Um, I, it seems that the case that three shots are, are safer than two or one, certainly more than one shot, um, and certainly, definitely more than people who are not vaccinated at all. Right. Uh, you know, some people don't want to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, many celebrities do not get vaccinated. Uh, if you look at the current, uh, you know, standoff uh, between, uh, you know, a, a major sports star in Australia, um, so, if COVID-19 vaccines are not 100% effective, then what can you advise people who are, you know, vulnerable uh, to getting this uh, new variant? You know, there's many, many medicines for other diseases that are not 100% um, effective or not 100% cure. Um, and, uh, you know, that doesn't mean we don't take them. So the fact that the, the, the vaccines are not 100% effective doesn't mean that we should dump them. And some of the vaccines, like the mRNA vaccines, are over 90% effective. That is very, very high um, efficacy, very high indeed. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's not that, uh, you know, we should, should we wait until there is 100%? That is just really, to be honest, that is really silly. We really need to vaccinate the whole world, and that's what at the People's Vaccine Alliance we will continue to advocate for. And once the whole world is vaccinated with first and second, and then we will call for a third dose for everybody. Um, and meantime, we are hoping that 
new vaccines are coming into um, being and you know more research is being done to reach this ideal vaccine that can stop transmission. But meantime, we have some effective vaccines and we should use them. Yeah, vaccines do cost money and especially the research and development of vaccines. It is a lengthy uh, period, it is costly with new variants emerging periodically one by one. Um, are biotech companies still capable to keep up? I mean, uh, is you know, researching and developing more vaccines financially viable for those uh, big pharma companies? Well, first, the, the cost of the research and development has largely been paid by governments, whether it's the US government, Europe, uh, or, or China. You know, the governments have paid, so basically it's our tax that has paid the majority, the absolute majority of, of the cost of, of R&D, of research and development. Um, and look at what's happening now. Actually, all companies had made profit, apart from AstraZeneca, because AstraZeneca, in their agreement with Oxford University, Oxford uh, is the inventor of the, uh, the vaccine, um, so Oxford forced the company that they should be, they should sell it at no profit. So AstraZeneca stand out as different from the others. But look at what Pfizer is making. Pfizer is making $36 billion this year. It is expected that the mRNA vaccines between Pfizer and Moderna will get um, an income to the companies of about $100, $100 billion next year. That never happened before. The companies never gained even $1 billion for the first year of launching a product. That never happened. So it's very, very uh, profitable market. And I think that they will be, uh, there will be a lot of competition for new vaccines and different vaccines. I mean, should companies or governments uh, worry about developing a new vaccine against Omicron at the moment? Or should they worry about really promoting you know, uh, vaccine you know, equitability? Uh, to people around the world uh, currently? There's different people who do these things, so it's not either or. These things should happen at the same time. So research is happening, I'm sure, in universities and in, in the companies, um, funded by the governments, but all the governments, but also, um, you know, um, expanding access to vaccines and forcing pharmaceutical companies to share knowledge about the vaccine um, the, the vaccine um, technology know-how with uh, capable companies in the South so that there is more vaccines, more doses are produced and more doses are distributed um, among the people who haven't had the vaccine so far. I mean, look at what's happening in Africa. It's less than 10% of the population has been vaccinated. But if you have more doses, more doses in terms of the number of doses globally, but more of these doses going to Africa, that's a distribution issue. Um, and then if you have the companies in, in the South producing, the cost will be less, the price will be less. So you have more doses, more going to Africa at lower price or at much, much low price, then you will have more people in Africa being vaccinated. I'm giving Africa as an example, but many developing countries are in the same situation. Yeah, you're talking about uh, vaccination uh, inequality, the, the gap, uh, the global south. Uh, we know both Delta and Omicron originated from the developing world, the global south. Um, do you see a correlation between inadequate vaccination and the emergence of new variants? I, I mean, scientifically, we still don't have um, enough data to make a ca ca causal relationship, say this causes that. Right. So what we have is just looking at the, 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 the context and what's happening. So the very first variant, the alpha variant, which originated in Britain, in Kent, that was at the time when there was no vaccine. So no vaccines, the virus had a wonderful chance to mutate. Um, but it wasn't, and spread faster than the original virus, but it wasn't um, very, very dangerous. I mean, it was more dangerous than the, the, the original virus, but not too bad. 
And since then, as I said, India, we had Delta starting in India because the, at that time, the vaccination rate in India was, I think, something like 3% of the population. So it's an ideal situation for the virus. When you have a little bit of people vaccinated and then the rest are not, then you have, the, the virus can mutate against the vaccines. This is the danger that it seems that rich countries particularly, um, and, and certainly pharmaceutical companies, don't seem to be realizing yeah. that you are allowing them, they are allowing the virus to mutate. They're giving them, they're giving the virus like lovely food on a plate by this. Some vaccinated, some are not vaccinated. It's um, it's a, it's a really bad recipe. Um, with, there was many the beta in South Africa and the gamma. So there was many variants, but like the the important ones and the more dangerous ones were um, Delta from India and Omicron from South Africa. And these are countries where they, the vaccinated, vaccination rate is not high enough. Okay, so co correlation is not necessarily uh, causation. Uh, yeah. Thank you for making that point yeah. clear to our audience. But how, how should uh, countries work to narrow the vaccination gap between the developed countries and the developing countries? Well, basically, we need more doses to go to developing countries. And it's no good saying, oh, well, we'll give the countries donation and basically give them the extra doses that we're not, use, we're not using if they are near expiry date. I mean, there are the stories about Nigeria having to get rid of one million doses of, of virus of vaccines because they, um, they're basically expired. But if you give them to Nigeria near expiry date, they're just going to expire. I mean, you know, it's, it's wrong. So if, if the donation is a temporary solution, that these rich countries that have, or any country that has more doses than they need, they should donate it now, before, long, long before the expiry date. So the countries um, like in Africa and others can actually plan and, um, you know, get their logistics um, ready to, um, to use these vaccines. But that is, as I say, temporary. What is needed is more vaccines and more vaccines means more production. And more production means production in developing countries by capable companies, which do exist. I mean, colleagues from the People's Vaccine Alliance um, a couple of weeks ago, just before Christmas, they released a study that showed that basically tracked um, a big number of companies in developing countries that are capable of producing their mRNA vaccines, but they can't because they don't have the technology. Now, with Pfizer, Moderna, and the American National Institute of Health, which has some of the um, know-how, would these people share the technology with these companies so that they can produce? Right. The WHO has set up a mechanism to facilitate this process of sharing technology. They, they set up um, the WHO COVID-19 technology access pool. They actually set it up in April, end of April, May in uh, two, uh, 2020. So kind of two years ago almost. And still companies are not doing anything. They're not coming near it even. They're not offering to say, well, okay, you know, I will share my technology with these conditions. Even that is, is not, uh, they haven't done it. They're just after making the highest possible profit. Well, Dr. Yanni, talking about measures to fight this pandemic and these many variants, um, governments, you know, are at the opposite ends of uh, measures. Uh, for example, China has been initiating and uh, sticking with its zero tolerance po policy or near zero case policy, um, you know, especially in the wake up to the Winter Olympics that will take place three weeks from now. But on the other hand, we have the United States, uh, you know, registering over one million cases per day with Omicron. And people, you know, in many states uh, still, you know, go partying and the restaurants are open, schools are open. Uh, I mean, what should be, uh, you know, the best practice around the world uh, currently now that we have Omicron and potentially many variants um, going forward? I mean, it's very difficult to say, um all countries should do one, two, three, although the WHO has clear guidelines from the beginning 
about what to do. So WHO has been saying, you know, distance, test, and trace, and vaccinate. Um, and, and then when data showed um, last year that, um, that masks can be very, uh, can, can pl pl play a very important role in prevention, they've been advocating masks. So at least these are the, the kind of standard um, practices that com countries should do that, that encourage people to distance, wear masks, and, um, and, and get vaccinated, and test and treat, test and, and, and trace, so that they, you can kind of control that. So some, some countries, like China, like Vietnam, actually, actually most countries in East Asia, you're used to having masks, for example, while here in, in Europe, people are not used to that. So it took, it took a bit of effort to get people to wear masks. But once the government said, everybody shall wear mask, mask in, 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 I don't know, in shops or in, in, in closed places, basically, the majority of people are listening and are wearing masks. So yes, governments can enforce certain, the, the standards that the WHO has, um, has put in, in, in in you know the guidelines that WHO has been uh, advocating for, so uh, whether the go some governments, so yeah, as you said, some governments are doing that to a greater degree, some to a lesser degree, and some are not doing um, what is needed really. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's hard to have a centralized policy in the many societies, including the United States. So we know that in developed countries, uh, most people are vaccinated. Uh, for example, in the U.S. More than 60, 60, 60 percent of Americans have been fully jabbed. But just last week, the country topped one million daily COVID-19 cases, uh, like we said. What's going wrong? So basically, when you say 60 percent are vaccinated, but you've got 40 percent not vaccinated. So you've got the 40 percent for the virus to spread. That's the first thing. The second thing is the vaccine does not stop transmission. The vaccine stops or, or decrease, decreases massively the danger of developing serious disease and the danger of death. That's what the, the vaccines do. It doesn't stop transmission. So I could be vaccinated, but I still can get the, the virus and therefore test positive and therefore be a number, you know, add to this number, the daily numbers of infection. But I can have it like a like a cold, like I will. But I will isolate, yeah. So I don't transmit it to other people. But for me, I wouldn't be suffering because I'm vaccinated. So that's what the vaccine does. Well, fact is, we have been living with COVID for two years now, two years exactly, and the pandemic still shows no signs of letting up. Uh, I mean, when can we see the end of the tunnel? When everybody is vaccinated. When we reach a highest uh, percentage of society in every society being vaccinated, um, and then we, we can say that we can you know have a sigh of relief. But we might we might uh, uh, until we have what you said at the beginning until we have the one percent the one hundred percent effective vaccine that is effective in in cutting transmission. So until we have that, we might need to have everybody vaccinated and everybody wearing masks in closed places. All right, Dr. Yanni, thank you so much for coming on The Hub on CGTN uh, once again. And thank you for all your work, you know, advocating for vaccine equality that is so important, especially for many developing societies who are struggling, you know, to get their citizens and residents vaccinated. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you. Come back again. Thank you. And that's all we have for this episode of The Hub. If you have any comments or suggestions about our program, feel free to contact me on social media. Thank you for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues 